Welcome to the 12 Step Recovery Evolution podcast. Visit recoveryevolution.co.uk for more episodes, helpful resources, and links to our social media. Also, visit the site for information on how you can attend a future Zoom session or workshop live. Thank you. Morning, <clears throat> morning, folks. Morning, everybody. Thanks for asking me to do this talk, and I think that um, uh, talking about relationships, and I kind of wasn't sure whether it was relationships with my work colleagues, friends the opposite sex, or I wasn't really sure what it was about. So I'm going to generalise. But I'm going to start off by just reading something from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, because it describes the alcoholic or the addict. So there's a reason for me doing this. So first of all, it says in here, on page 62, selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking and self-pity, we step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. And then further down, it says, so our troubles we think are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourselves. And the alcoholic or the addict is an extreme example of self-will run riot, though he usually doesn't think so. Above everything, we alcoholics must be rid of this selfishness. We must or it will kill us. And God makes that possible. So that's, that's the first bit. And there's also a bit in here on page 52 that describes the alcoholic or the addict. And it says here, this describes me. So we were having trouble with personal relationships. We couldn't control our emotional natures. We were prey to misery and depression. We couldn't make a living. We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. We were unhappy. We couldn't seem to be of real help to any any to other people so when you kind of describe yourself when you're honest enough to be able to say that about yourself i think would you want to be in a relationship would you want to be in an intimate and personal relationship with someone like that i think that you know when i came into recovery i've written some things down here which i think are really important to, to to um to to add you know, when I come into recovery, not only am I a drug addict and an alcoholic, and I've got all them traits in there, I've also come in and uh, I've come in from a broken family. Mum's alcoholic. My dad's not very well. They divorced. So I'm coming into recovery. And I, I think I got into my first opposite sex relationship when I was about nine months clean with a fella from NA. And uh, so I'm... I'm going into this relationship and I'm just totally, totally broken. I'm totally, totally can't bear myself. I've got like a a barrage of unmet childhood needs. Um, I continually feel condemned. You know, my mum left me. My dad um, broke loads of boundaries of what a father has. So I just felt totally condemned all my life. And then I, not only did I have that in my childhood, but I also then, through my addiction, I repeated them relationships. Um, I got into cycles with people, so then relationships would repeat themselves, and I just didn't have any value on myself. So coming into recovery, that doesn't just go away, you know. Um, so I, I kind of got into this relationship, and I'm... I'm obviously, I don't know if you guys understand what happens in recovery, you kind of start to attract the people that are the same as you. So I've attracted this poor boy from NA uh, who's broken just like I am. And, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time through seven years I was in this relationship with him, honestly. Uh, I've had two, two relationships with the opposite sex since I've been in recovery, one for seven years and then re- the other one was for four years. And um, throughout that whole relationship with him, like, my intentions were pure. My intentions, I wanted to be with him, I thought I loved him, um, but he just kept hurting me, hurting me, cheating on me, and I'd, and I'd go back again and I'd trust him and I'd believe him and he'd say, Sonia, this ain't about you, this is more about me, why would you make it about you? And I'm like, well, it is about me, you've really hurt me. And 
and we kind of went round in that cycle for seven years, seven years, and uh, and I think that kind of codependency. When you talk about codependency, I think that what I understand of codependency was more important for me to be in this relationship than to think about my own welfare. To think about, and it took me a kind of long time to kind of um, to kind of uh, get over that cycle. But he was a great teacher. He was a great teacher to me, and now I realise that. He had his own issues, and I had my own issues, and it just yeah, it just took me a long time to overcome, and I just didn't have any value on myself. Um, I kind of learnt that through my childhood, and then also from my from my own uh, kind of journey in my addiction. I just didn't have any value on myself, so I really let him. I really invited him in to really come and harm me, and. Uh, when you look at my dad, my dad kind of abused the boundaries. He he didn't have any respect for uh, for me as a child, and I've kind of attracted a man in my life that's similar to that. So um, now I can look at him and I can think that you know I would I think I would like to have a conversation with him now and. Uh, I would like to have a conversation with him and just say, look, it's over, it's finished. But um, we was very turbulent and we really hurt each other quite a lot. And I remember like, uh, I remember listening to one of his shares. Uh, he done, he's in recovery himself and he's been in NA for a good few years. And I remember listening to one of his shares and I was totally like, I couldn't understand it. He was saying, yeah, I went out with this girl and... Then I went out with her sponsee and this and that. And then the whole of the audience started laughing. They found it funny. And I thought, I just don't know what's funny about that, you know, because the truth is he did go out with me. Then he did go out with my little girl that I was helping. And then she killed herself. She fucking died of an overdose. So I'm like, what's funny about that? What, you know, and I think that the one of the biggest problems within the rooms is these opposite sex relationships and I think that um you know when when you kind of come in and you concede to being having this mental condition like when you come in and you've conceded to having this mental condition and then you keep trying to go out and have these relationships I think it's just really harmful and I think the most important thing that I've had um if for my journeys, I've got good people around me who've been able to guide me and say, Sonia, have you thought about that? Have you thought about that? Because I just didn't have the, 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 the neural nets, the brain capacity to be able to think of them, you know, them other ideas. And I think that through them years that I had with him, um, I think that's very animal instinct, very, I was very hurt. Old patterns keep repeating themselves. And I think for the age that I was, where I was at in my recovery, all was relative. Uh, it was very, very sexually orientated. Um, that was all I had, you know, that was all I really had to bring to the game. And uh, But I didn't realise that at the time. I really thought it was love. And, you know, I was always very, um, I was always honest with them and, uh, but he just didn't have it to give back to me. And uh, but, and I was also a very hurt person. I wanted him to be my sponsor, my dad, my God, my boyfriend. Oh, you know, all these unmet childhood needs onto him. So I'm so glad that, that I'm so glad that I kind of could look at that now. And, uh, and it was a really valuable lesson for me. I wouldn't recommend anyone to do it. It was seven years of torture, you know, and, and I believe that we should always listen to our children because children are very perceptive. My daughter hated him. <laughs> so we should always listen to our children. And uh, so, I, you know, I don't believe that he, he was him and I was me. We were two hurt people coming together trying to have this relationship. And, uh, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't like um, continually feeling condemned, even when people had point something out even in them times even when someone said to me Sonia how are you doing 
I'd literally take that as a personal attack and I'd want to ask someone else. I was so kind of separate from myself. I was so separated from myself and having any idea or any awareness of myself. I'd want to ask someone else, I don't know, how am I? You know, so how, how can we possibly, you know, when you look at the, the, the what a relationship, what having a relationship with someone actually means. I was looking it up this morning. It's a close connection between two people. The way in which two people with two things are in connection. So if you've got no connection with yourself, with God, or you, there's no way you can start connecting with other people. So it's took me a long time to kind of, of the opposite sex. So it's, it took me a long time to kind of understand that. Yet. Broken people, when we come into recovery, that's all we want to do. But that's all I wanted to do was connect with someone else, so just being with someone else. And But thankfully, after that seven years was over, that turbulent, hurtful, unnecessary, uh, unnecessary seven, pain, seven painful years, kind of I learned a lot about myself. Then I had two years by myself. Um, two years on my own and then I got into another relationship and that previous like nine years really taught me a lot and uh, it, I started to think about who I was, who's Sonia, what is her needs, what does she want to do, what does she like, you know, I've never had the courage to express my needs, I've never, his needs were more important than my needs and I've never kind of had the courage or the neural nets to have the voice to even express what my needs are. So this second relationship I got into, um, I started, it took four years and like, he's a really nice fella. Everything about him was perfect. Um, the music, the stuff we like doing, his look, everything about him was perfect for me. And, uh, and I think that, um, you know, he his journey ended up going wherever he's got gone, and he 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 was too scared to continue to 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 address his issues and to be in recovery and get the help that he needs. So so that's where we kind of ended because um, I need some emotional connection. I want to be with a man. I, I want to be with a man who is a man, rich in manness, you know, who can support me when I'm feeling down or, you know, he can be there for me emotionally and love me through my mental stages. And uh, so it, in that relationship, it kind of got to a point where I didn't feel so condemned anymore. You know, now I'm, you, you're talking now like I'm... 10 coming up to nine, 10 years clean, you know, I'm starting to find a voice and express what my needs are. I'm, um, I've, I'm, I'm more confident in myself. Um, I've, I've been practicing the program all along. I've been listening to people in healthy relationships. You know, I listen to other people in, who are in healthy, good relationships. And I think, no, that's what I want. That's what I need in my life. You know, I want, I want to be able to, I want someone to care about how I feel. I don't want to feel alone in this relationship when I'm supposed to be with someone. I want, I want to have, I want to have a connection with, with somebody. And, uh, um, and I believe that also due, due to the fact that I'm now, you know, I was coming onto my fifties. I'm, coming up to my ten, nine, ten years clean, I think that was all relative. So I think that all my needs changed in that relationship. The, the one I had, the last one that I've had for four years, all, but the first relationship I had was very sexually orientated. And now that I'm getting a little bit older, more settled in my recovery, um, that's the least important thing in my life now. There's more important things in my life than, than the kind of sexual need. That is very important, but it isn't the most important. And, uh, you know, I, I now believe that there's a bit in the big book. So I've spoken about the problems that is spoke about in the big book, but this is what the solution is. This is what I believe is the solution. And I've spoke to Lester earlier and I said, you know, I'm 13 years clean. And it makes me want to cry, honestly. I feel like I'm finally 
ready. Sonia is present and I'm finally ready to go into a relationship. And I do not want to go out with someone in recovery. <laughs> Let me tell you. But it says in here, on page 164 of the big book, see to it that your relationship with him is right and then great events will come to pass for you and countless others. So I believe that see to it that your relationship with God is right first and then your relationship with other people will be at their best. And uh, it, it, it speaks a lot about relationship. If you think about us in recovery, the big book, the NA textbook, loads of other spiritual books, the Bible, it's all talking about relationships. So that would suggest that us people, not just addicts, but people in general, suffer from problematic relationships. So I think that even, even, when, even when you think about my relationships at work, the closest people to me, because it's not just about the opposite sex, You've got my daughter, you've got my work relationships and my friends. Honestly, I could make them want to cry. The most, pe the most important, the most problematic, yet the most important relationships in my life are all my friends in recovery. You know, you've got, I've got my work relationships. I've struggled in them. Lester and Janie and Pauline, I've, I've struggled in them relationships. You know, I'm quite judgmental. I'm quite unforgiving. I'm quite. Um, I'm quite sharp. I'm quite. Um, to, I'm quite blunt. But thankfully, I've got this program, and I've got people that I can talk to that can help me work through them processes. And then I think, then I think to myself, um, you know, how, how you know how would they? How would how how do I want to be treated? Am I, you know, I make mistakes. I, would I want someone to be unforgiving towards me? And, and I think the biggest, one of the biggest lessons on, on resentment and then the amends that I've learned, and it's so simple, honestly, is that I had a resentment once to Matt. Now, I worked with Matt for 12 years, every day, side by side. I had a resentment to him. And I remember talking to Lester about it. and. Um, and Lester said to me, Sonia, have you spoken to him? Have, Sonia, have you sat down and spoken to him? And what I learned from that process is that I'm willing to go beyond every, his, someone's back and go, nye, 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 and moan about somebody. But I haven't actually got the courage to go and speak to them. And that all comes from low self-esteem, not worthy, he don't care. And honestly, when I'd done it, when I went and had that conversation with Matt, I said, Matt, can I talk to you for a minute? I took him in the room and we had a conversation and uh, we, had, we never had that issue again. And he, he went to me, sorry, Sonia, I never even thought. Like, and we never, ever had that issue again. And, uh, and I think that is one of the simplest solutions to our problems. I think that the lack of communication, our lack of ability to have honest communication with our fellows, and I think... That's, um, that's been my solution with Lester, with Janie, with all my work colleagues. Um, you know, I, I believe that if I, if I put value on people, I need to go and talk to them and tell them how I feel. You know, all my friendships that I've got, the people that I've got around me, you know, Kelly, Adam, Siobhan, little Jody, and all the people, Ellie, Eleanor, all the people that I've got around me, I value them. You know, I don't, if I, if I can't answer the phone, I phone them back. I don't ignore the phone. I don't, you know, every now and then I might get that, oops, <laughs> phone's ringing, but I do, I value all my friendships. I don't know where I'd be without my friends. You know, my friends are the most important people in my life. And, you know, thinking, thinking of how I was then when I first got clean, like, it makes me feel really sad. And I think, it total my brain was underdeveloped total animal instinct it was all about me or i felt so unloved honestly when i first got clean for the first few years the first four or five years i was doing a lot of na and um 
doing a lot of working with a lot of people and having been blessed enough to be able to be part of people's journeys and I think because I had no love for myself um I had not one ounce of love for myself but through going through that process I started to you know tenfold love coming back to me and I think that was so so important for my life because I didn't feel any of that for myself and then as the journey went on as the journey went on, I started feeling it for myself rather than getting it from other people. And I think, if you think my relationship with my daughter, honestly, it took me till now, I know that I'm the first person she phones when something happens. If she gets a job, if she gets sacked from a job, if, she's, if she has a medical thing going on, I know I'm the first person that she, that she calls. And I think that, that relationship's been really hard work. There's been a couple of times, I think one time where I've been stood over a bed, we've argued, and I really had to walk away and it made me really cry and I phoned Lester and went, you know, I don't want to be like that in them. I don't want to have them with kind of relationships. But I think that when we have a good argument, if you have a good argument and there's been issues, if you find a solution, I think it's all been worthwhile. But if you keep arguing about the same thing, I think it's just a whole waste of time, you know. I think me and Jodie have learned, you know, she hasn't been in had any therapy yet. She's still too hurt. Um, I think we've started to be honest with each other, you know, about how we feel. I've I think that I'm very, I think we're, we're the most intimate that we've ever been. Um, and uh, I think that, yeah, I think she has the courage now to be honest with me. She knows that I'm stable. She knows that I'm going to love her. Whatever, whatever decisions she makes, whatever she does, I'm always there to support her. And uh, whether she makes mistakes or speeding tickets, set from jobs, the choice of her fella, whatever decision she makes, she knows that I'm there at support for her. And, uh, and I think that I've always craved good relationships. I've always, always, always craved good relationships. And I think that finally, honestly, it took me 13 years to be comfortable in my, everyone wants a quick fix, like two seconds clean, want, want to be with someone. But, uh, you know, I think it's different if you've been around recovery a few years and you kind of understand what's going on. But, like, when you first clean, like, when, when you listen to the stuff that I first read out, like that stuff from page 52 and about selfishness, self-centeredness, that is a problem. Who would want to be in that relationship with someone, you know? Who would want to be in a rela relationship with someone like that? And in the big, in the 12 and 12, it says this when it talks about relationships, it's quite clear. Everyone like says, oh, don't say nothing. It does say about relationships. And what it says here is, one, the people should be solid AAs. So solid in AA. But I take that to mean being sponsored, having some clean time, work, work through the steps, made your amends. That's what I believe is you're in. You conceded you're in. That's a solid AA to me. Two, it says, you should be compatible on the spiritual, mental, and emotional level and long enough acquainted so that it's fact, not wishful thinking. Majority of relationships, wishful thinking, my experience. Number three, it says, need to be sure that no deep underlying emotional handicap in either will be likely to rise up at, a late, at later pressures to cripple them. So that's like... After the honeymoon period's over, after you've like, banged each other to death, <laughs> we've all had it, you know, you've got to just be honest with yourself. After the sexual stuff's over, or the, 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 the pink cloud disappears, you know, and life happens, you've got to be thinking, am I, am I ready for this? And what if it finishes? Am I ready for that? You know, uh, relationships are difficult. Being in a relationship, with another person is a very, very difficult thing. And I think that once you can see that, once you can see that actually, would I really want to inflict myself on somebody, let alone another lunatic, 
that isn't able to fulfill any of my needs. I was trying to get lunatics to fulfill my needs. And I finally realized like that, and I just want to add as well, within my relationship practicing, I was conceded, done, in the rules. I was all, I've always been supported, I've always practiced the program. So there, for me, there was no, oh, my cat's trying to. There was, there was no, um, there was no relapses for me in my um, relationship torment. But I'm telling you now, I was torn. Oh, go on. I was tormented. I was, I was very, very tormented. I spent a lot of sleepless nights, feeling really hurt, um, really pressed into the program, pressed into the meditation, pressed into being honest, phoning up people, being honest about how I feel. You know, there was times when, I'm sure Michael will remember, there was times when I'd finish with the first boyfriend I had and, and I'd try and get everyone on the hate him campaign. And, <laughs> you know, there was them days and, and, and I'd just see how immature I was, how immature I was and uh, underdeveloped and unable to have them relationships. But, um, but I have learned... I've got a lot of good, healthy relationships in my life. My work relationships, my friend relationships, I'm committed, I'm there. You know, I, I value my friends. Um, and my daughter, my relationship with my daughter is very important to me. I think that honesty is very important. I think being present is important. Relationships are the most important thing in my life. I think if you do them, practice the program, do the sex inventory, write out your sane and sound ideal. You know, when I was young in recovery, when I was doing my sane and sound ideal, really, if I was to be honest with myself, the two people that I went with, the first one definitely didn't fit the bill. The second one did for the first couple of years, but then, because he changed his mind about recovery and didn't want to do the recovery stuff, so he wasn't, so that ended healthily. I don't have any malice about him. I don't feel any bad feeling towards him. I'm still friends with his family, you know. But I think if you do the same and sound ideals and do the, what the program suggests, you know, you kind of get there eventually. You're going to get, you're going to be compatible with someone. You're going to find a, a good relationship. But again, that's not all what it's about, the opposite sex. It's about friendships, work colleagues, children, people down the shop, my next door neighbour, you know, there's all sorts of relationships. But I think that um, honesty, stability are the most important things. Honesty, what are my needs? What, where are my needs being met? What, and what can I bring to this relationship? Can I bring, can I help, can I add, add anything to this man's relationship? What can I do to help him? You know, and I spent a bit of time doing that with the last one, you know, lots of chances. Hope I was hoping that he would make the decision to grow and develop with me. He didn't want to do that and that's fine. And then, you know, and then we decided to, then we decided to part. But um, yeah, I don't really know what else to say really. But so I think it's about the program, good sponsorship, good network. Always recommend a bit of therapy in early recovery. I had therapy for a couple of years on and off in early recovery. Um, take direction. Start listening to what people are saying. Uh, you can hear it, but you need to listen to it. You need to listen to it. And uh, I, I don't feel condemned anymore. I don't feel condemned. I'm able to take on feedback. Sometimes it might hurt me like, oh, but I'm able to take it on and make the changes if I feel the need to, if I, if I want to. But I feel finally at 13 years clean, continual recovery, continual practice in the program. I ain't perfect, you know, I, I ain't perfect either. So continually practicing, practicing the program, trying to grow and develop myself, trying to learn how to talk a little bit softer, nicer, you know, trying to forgive people. Um, my relationships in my life are great and I'm finally ready I think to to see what God's got in store for me but um yeah so that's that's all I've got to say about relationships hello mate um 
Hello, Sonia. That was amazing. Really good, beautiful stuff. Known you a long time. I consider you a real friend. Um, so much honesty there and so very insightful. Mm. And yeah, you have to be. Relationships are tough. Relationships, I've, I've done one big toxic relationship and I relapsed in that relationship and uh, cool, that was painful. And um, yeah, you're so right. We're, we're us to, I'm not gonna speak for Lindsay, I only speak for myself, but you know, I want to grow in a relationship. I, for me personally, I love with being someone who also is working a program, um, but, but it, it's, it's tough and, I loved what you said about I had to get to that point where I really loved myself, not in a narcissistic way, but in a spiritual way. Um, Cause we have to, cause if I go into a relationship with low self esteem, I'm just carrying all that shit. And I'll be honest with you. When we first got together, my old green eyed monster kicked up. I got jealous over a couple of things and I will, speak for Lindsay this but I'll just say what she 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 said Mike I'm not having that I'm not Joe you know Joe was she, she said I'm not your past partner I, you know I care and I, I love myself enough to, I'm not going to put up with that if you're going to get jealous over someone in a meeting or something stupid and I, I got straight on the phone to me sponsor I prayed I worked the program around it and I kid you not within a week it was gone and this was like a deep underline you know me well enough so it was like a deep underlying insecurity you know all that stuff around my mum and everything leaving when i was a kid and we used to both talk about our parents and you know um and it went it was a miracle it and it's never come back again that green-eyed monster and you know that that showed me the power of this program it was that was incredible you know, and I, I too, I mean, I've done three years on my own. I did two years on my own. But the two years I did on my own the last time, it was really because I went through a lot of trauma. I really, 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 through that trauma, connected to God and grow to love myself. And that's the only way you can enter into a relationship. You can't enter into a relationship looking to take. You've got to really go in and look to see what you can give. Um, that was a brilliant, brilliant talk. And I'm so grateful that I know you. Thank you so much. I love you loads. Can I just nip in there quickly as well? Sorry. Um, yeah, that was absolutely brilliant, Sonia. I was nodding my, help, my head at, at so many things that you said. And, um, you know, for me, it's so important that I don't allow myself to be treated the way that I was in past relationships. You know, it is about loving yourself and I'm okay. I don't have to be treated like a, a doormat I don't have to allow myself to be treated like a doormat I should say um you know and without doing a massive PDA you, me and Mike we grow together you know we grow spiritually together um and it's a relationship that isn't just based on the physical which I've felt like you said I've felt in the past that all I have to give is sex you know that was like my worth and I don't feel like that anymore I am okay I am worthy um and to be with somebody who appreciates that and, and you know, just encourages that and, and excels that is, is just so important. And, you know, I've never had that before. So I'm growing spiritually every day um, and, I, and I know my worth. So, yeah, it was, it was amazing, Sonia. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you. Thanks, guys. And I've got Tracy. Morning, everyone. Morning, Sonia. Um, morning dear morning well i mean you just every single bit of what you said was you know it's just it's just right and it, you, you your experience to share that with people is amazing um i think well you know we you were my step four step five go to and i went through all that with you and you were amazing and, and a lot of what came out of that was low self-esteem for me which is the one thing i've been trying to build on um, I've just done my step four, step five with my other sponsor and, and the most amazing part is the sane and sound sex life ideals that I came up with you, you know, you helped me come up with. They haven't actually changed. 
And I don't think that means I haven't grown. I think it means that you really, really <laughs> that area so well. I'm sure there's a couple of others I could add on to really, but you know, that side of it, I think was quite personal between us and you really, really, really helped me there. So, you know, I just think you're amazing. You're always there for me. Yeah, I don't like what you've got to say sometimes, but I know that you do it with every best intention because you love me to pieces <laughs> and you're never wrong. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I don't always listen, but I come back and I tell you what I've done and I'm honest with you and it's just a great relationship. And I think that you're one amazing lady and I... Um, now you've got to 13 years, I wish you every luck with finding yourself somebody lovely because you well deserve it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say this as well. I forgot to say this. I've got, had this written down. I think it's important. I only learned this a couple of years ago. I see a little meme on Facebook and it says this. When parents devalue their children or neglect their children or do something negative towards their children the children don't devalue them back the children start to devalue themselves so the child what's might be my experiences because my parents didn't have it to give me they devalued me so i started to devalue myself but i've never devalued them it's a funny thing isn't it I was, and i see it in my I see in my daughter's sister and brother, they, where their parents have neglected and devalued them, the children start to devalue themselves. And it's the saddest, saddest thing that I know that I'm responsible for doing that with my, my daughter. In a court of law, I'm guilty, Your Honour. You know, I've devalued her. My mum devalued me. So recovery, Relationships is about, I need to put value on this person, not just my daughter, but everybody. Just wanted to add that in. So when you're devaluing people, your children, they start to devalue themselves. Thank you. I've got Maz next. Hi, Hi Maz. Maz. Uh, I think you, no, I'm not hearing you. Your mic's, you're unmuted, but there's no words coming out. Can you hear me? Can just about. Um, I related to loads of what you said there, Sonia. And I remember when I first got clean and I wouldn't dare go near a lad. Didn't want a relationship. It put fear into me because I've never had a relationship clean ever, you know. And then a couple of years down the line, I ended up, as soon as someone showed a bit of interest, who happened to be a narcissist predator, <laughs> and even though I'd heard the rumours and all that, I still went there, you know. And it was really nice at first. And they kind of, it, 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 it fizzled out. And I started seeing all his traits. But I still went back, you know, like the drugs. <laughs> Kept chasing it, thinking I'd get the feelings <laughs> from the start. Uh, but the other day, you know, I ended up going back there and just really really felt the pain and I'm not gonna lie I did get the obsession to use but luckily I've got faith and I've got a bit of recovery in me recovery in me and I've got defects as well like stubbornness and arrogance and I'm glad I've got them as well because they came in handy at that moment but um and you're worth more Maz you're worth more but I've got to look at why I keep going back because I know deep down that it's wrong you know, I spent you don't twenty. Value yourself. I spent twenty odd years using drugs, and that was harming me. Now I'm harmless. I put the drugs down, but I'm still harming me. So I'm not even getting the buzz out of it. So, so I do. I I did get a corrective measure. I know when I shared some steps in that with you, you did suggest counselling, and I was like, oh no. Nah. But I have. I finally decided that it's what I need to do. I need to get to the root of this. You know. Why do I keep going back? It's like someone said, low self-esteem. Where's low self-esteem from? Childhood trauma, you know, and I need to pick all that apart. And that's what I'm going to do. Because I can't keep, as I said, the, the, that was the first time the obsession to use had come from a relationship. And I'm not, I'm not, not prepared to put myself through that, you know. So yeah, um, I'm glad I came on. 
uh, got loads out of that share, and I'm glad I put your support in that. So yeah, that, that's it. Over You're now. worth more. Up next, I've got Kelly. So nay. Ah, <laughs> uh, um. Well, I don't know what to say. I get a little bit emotional because I think you just taught me so much from coming into treatment. And um, I remember you saying in early recovery that um, when I was in treatment, you're like, I can't get anywhere near you. Um, and I didn't want you anywhere near me because you, you were one of those people that was so honest from such a loving place, but I weren't ready to hear it. And uh I came in with a string of destructive, horrible relationships, um, as a lot of us did. And I had a, um, I was a serial meat fillers in uh, rehab girl. Um, so I brought all that with me and I continued that behavior in treatment. Um, I felt so, so shit about myself. I just wanted somebody to love me. Um, and the thing that I've, all the way along from there to the point that I'm at now, and in all my relationships, to be honest, I could ask you as one of my closest friends now, but you've just been by my side. And the one thing that I love about you is it's always the truth. You'll, you'll hit me with the truth because that's what you hear. Um, and that's a wonderful thing. Like I said, in the early days, I couldn't hear that stuff. I didn't want to look at it. But like someone else said, you're always on point with it but you'll bear with people along the way with that stuff I remember getting in, an, in a relationship and I was kind of <laughs> and it and it went really really wrong but all the way through that you were still loving me through it even though I was going against the the advice that you were giving me and you were trying to support me through it and it's like I thought I still knew better and you know it went tits up and and I'm grateful now that it did I learned a lot from that and you've helped me get to the point where I'm not ready for a relationship. <laughs> I'm not because I've still got a lot of healing to do, um, a lot of work on myself, um, on my value, valuing myself more before I'm going to have anything else to give because um, I'm just a massive selfish taker. Um, and I've improved so much. I think that that's another thing you said to me is I'm in the best position I've ever been where it comes to relationships with men, definitely. But I know I've kind of accepted that very recently that I'm not quite ready and that's okay because I've got love to give my kids. I'm learning in that sense. And that's the wonderful thing is I think you've got so much experience with the relationship stuff in all aspects that, um, you know, I'm just glad I got you by my side through that. Um, even when I don't like what you've got to tell me, I know it's out of a place of love now. It took me a little while to realize that, but um, I'm so grateful for that value, valuable again valuable information that you give me and that love and support through that process um and i've definitely grown and and, and you're a massive part of that massive so uh, thank you i'll leave it there hello um thank you so much sonia i actually um this week i think like john said earlier um it has got my like emotions and and just everything sort of really up and down but i did find that um really like uplifting and, and just quite empowering what you said um i think like for me you know i'm 29 years old and i think um social media these days and all like the dating apps and everything like that like i'm not on them but it's so out there even with this lockdown you know it's all you really like hear about and everything like that and it's so sort of forced um that you kind of should be dating it's what all my friends back home um like obsess over so I then struggle having healthy relationships with my friends. Um, and, you know, I thought that by this age, I don't know where I got this idea from, but I thought I would definitely be married with kids, have a house and everything, but I have a family. Um, but, you know, instead I ended up alcoholic in rehab, got my two dogs and I live by myself and I'm single. And that's actually it's exactly where I need to be right now. Um, but, you know, when I was in treatment, um, I was still like, I had no idea how unwell I was, to be honest. And um, a lot of people on here know that I sort of tried to get into a relationship there. And I always remember you said to me, this for you could be 
devastating. Um, and those words like the devastating always stuck with me. Um, but I, and I remember, I know I used to think about it and I used to think, well, what does she mean by devastating? Does she mean I'm going to end up dead? Does she mean I'm going to end up relapsing? Does she mean I'm going to turn to heroin? Um, and yet even all of those options and me considering them as possibilities, I still clung on to that bit of attention um, and that bit of apparently someone loved me over the thought of all of them possibilities happening. And I think to me that just really shows now when I can think about it, um, just quite how unwell I was um, and how I really would have gone with literally anyone. Like Lester said the other day about we settle for people. Um, I mean, the person I'm talking about, there wasn't really anything about them um likable to be honest but they were there they were available and they apparently liked me um and i completely and utterly went for it just because i needed that attention because i didn't have any love for myself and i still really struggle with that um but it's like people having you in my life and a lot of other women on this meeting and, and stuff like that that have really really helped me um and i do feel not amazing but i feel okay and i feel like i'm getting there slowly on my own and single. So yeah, I just I just want to say thank you mainly for being there. Thank you. You're a lovely girl and also you're worth more. <laughs>